It is uh, incredible, incredible to have all of you here tonight for those, those hanging with us uh, at home, uh, wherever you're at tonight, welcome. It's a joy and it's a, a great privilege tonight uh, to talk about something that will mean uh, something to some of you, but to others of you, it means uh, absolutely nothing. This is the uh, bubble gum of my youth, a bazooka bubble gum. How many by applause have had some bazooka in your lifetime? All right. It's multifaceted. A bazooka, you felt like you were getting your five cents worth because you got a included comic. And then when you went to, uh, to put it in your mouth, you realized that you were eating a pink brick, okay? It, it created a, a ton of needed bridge work. I think as uh, bazooka faded out, it hurt the dental industry in some regards. I mean, it was a, a pretty girthy, massive piece of gum. It took 25 minutes just to soften it, okay? But for whatever reason, we enjoy the indulgence of bazooka. Now, as a, as a young man living in Waverly, Iowa, uh, my parents uh, moved there. I was eight or nine years old and decided uh, with one of my friends to uh, ride our bike the mile or mile and a half or so to the uh, nearest gas station. Uh, we didn't have any money with us. It just seemed uh, like a, a mode of independence just to even ride our bike there. And, and so we did, and, and when we walked in, uh, my friend, he, uh, he nudged my back and said, hey, why don't you take one of those pieces of bazooka? And I turned to him initially and said, I, I, don't, I don't have five, so like, I don't, we, don't, we didn't bring any money. I, I didn't have a nickel. We didn't have anything to buy it with. And he said, no, I, uh, that's what I'm saying. Just, just take it. I know I had done a lot of sinning before that day. My mom, dad will attest to that, uh, certainly. But this is the first moment that I can remember um, not just acting on temptation, but feeling all the effects. So I, I reached down in the little bazooka box and slyly I slid it into my pocket like, a, you know, like someone that was a, a professional heister. Is that a word? Someone that was good at stealing. And the moment I walked out of the store, I... I felt this overwhelming sense of um, darkness, conviction. It was the longest 10, 15 minute bike ride uh, maybe I've ever had in my life. I mean, my, my stomach was churning with what I had done. I, I walked in uh, to the house. My mom, I can't remember the question she asked me. Uh, hey, how, how was the trip? Mom, I stole a piece of gum. I mean, I just, I had to tell somebody. I, I just, I had to confess it. And so thankfully I had a mother uh, who, who took me back to the gas station and I uh, feebly walked up to the, the cashier and laid a nickel on the counter and said, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I stole um, one of these pieces of bazooka. I have, I have sinned many days uh, from that day, including uh, these current hours recently, but since that day, I've been processing an important question. Why, why in the world, knowing the Lord at the time, which I did, knowing that a stealing is against God's design, why, why would I sign a treaty? Why would I make peace with evil? Why would I give in uh, to peer pressure, the temptation of my friend? Why do I compromise? It's this question uh, that's going to face us for many weeks as we begin a brand new journey, my friends, through uh, the book of Daniel. We're entitling the series The God of Daniel, just like the God of Joseph, because the emphasis will not be on a human. The emphasis will be on the Most High. Uh, the desired intent of our study and time together is not so that you leave here even tonight saying, I need to be more like Daniel. The desire is that you would leave here as a worshiper of the one true almighty God. We will never escalate 
man. Man is nothing without God. With God, though, the scripture says, all of a sudden, sons and daughters of the Most High. And so I invite you, if you don't uh, have a journal, you can grab one as you walk out as well, or turn into your Bibles or your phones to the book of Daniel. First, some Old Testament survey. Just the brief version. Uh, I don't have an hour to go through this, but uh, for those that haven't taken some time to walk through the Old Testament, there are 39 books uh, in the Old Testament. I I know many of you likely don't frequent it. I I understand it kind of. I mean, if if you go to a, a, a car store and they say, okay, so what would you like? Would you like an old car or would you like a new car? Money doesn't matter. Uh, Generally speaking, okay, uh, outside of a couple classic car seekers in us, uh, most of us are choosing the new car. So so maybe even the term Old Testament uh, has kept some of you away from the richness of its beauty. Uh, It is foundational to our understanding of God's word because... It follows the relationship between God and his people, the nation of Israel. What the nation of Israel reveals hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times over is that they are in and of themselves incapable of following God, that they need a savior. So the whole Old Testament shows us, including the 400 plus years of silence between the Old and the New Testament, shows us we need a savior. And here enters the Christ. Well, Daniel finds its, uh, its way into what's called the major uh, prophets. The law, the first five books of the Bible, are written uh, at least until the end by Moses. The poetry books, which some of you appreciate. Uh, I'm right now going through Psalms in my morning walks. I uh, just listened to Psalm 86, 87, and 88 this morning. Rich stuff. But it's the, the major prophets where Daniel finds itself in. What we're gonna do this summer is we're gonna study the first six chapters uh, at length. We're gonna summarize then the rest of the prophecy from chapter seven till the end. Uh, The prophecy is helpful, however quite redundant. And so we'll be able to in our last uh, time together in Daniel summarize uh, the, uh, the prophetic words that Daniel received. So all of that said, We are ready to take this 10 or 11 week journey through the book of Daniel. Here we go. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, stop, it's gonna take us 15 minutes just to get out of verse one. Now, the third year of the rule of of Jehoiakim, it narrows the precise date that this is being written, which is helpful. Uh, He takes rule in 609. But in, uh, according to Babylonian calendaring, uh, you don't count your first year that you've risen to power. And so Jehoiakim actually comes to power in 608. You do the quick math, 608 minus three, it means that this is 60, come on now, five, all right? Some of you a little skittish on your math, that's okay. 605 is where we find ourselves. Uh, Jehoiakim is the king of Judah, Uh, some of you may think that that's exactly the same as the nation of Israel, but actually, uh, Israel at the time was separated into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom, which uh, was the residence of 10 of the tribes of Israel, okay, it was uh, simply called Israel, or at times Samaria. And then the southern kingdom, which is what we're of interest uh, in our text tonight. Jehoiakim is the ruler of Judah, Jerusalem, is the capital, and so here we find ourselves in 605. Now, uh, there's an interesting next character. In the 90s, some of you, uh, you grew up with something called the Veggie Tales, okay? Uh, some of you were ruined by the Veggie Tales. This story, for some of you, was ruined by a pickle, okay? I'm, I'm really, I'm, re- I'm really sorry, okay? Um, his real name is Nebuchadnezzar. It's not Nebi, okay? Um, Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon, and the scripture says he came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Well, let's talk about Nebuchadnezzar. His uh, father, the ruler of Babylon, has a, uh, a high, ag- aggressive, 
a desire to take over the world. Of course, in this ancient Mesopotamian times, there were many empires. And so Nebuchadnezzar's father begins one by one to go against the other competitors. Eventually, though, Nebuchadnezzar's father gets ill. And in his illness, not losing his desire, he hands the baton to his son, Nebuchadnezzar II. Now, what's interesting is, is Nebuchadnezzar all of a sudden finds himself ruling, not yet king, but ruling over the armies, the great armies of Babylon. There were two major competitors at the time. The first was the Assyrian Empire. I don't have time to go through the whole history of Assyria, except to say that Assyria for, uh, formed a bit of an allegiance with Egypt to overthrow Babylon. Well, unfortunately, they timed their efforts inappropriately, and all of a sudden, Assyria found itself solely against Babylon. And so Nebuchadnezzar wipes out almost nearly completely the Assyrian Empire, which had massive prominence at the time. And then in a famous battle, you can look up the history of the Battle of Carchemish later, here shown by my quality green map, okay? In the Battle of Carchemish, all of a sudden, after the Assyrians were wiped out, with a few of the remnants, Egypt finds its way at Carchemish, again, poorly timed. And so looking to the south, Babylon, just having wiped out Assyria, now wipes out the whole Egyptian army, again, under the leadership of Nebuchadnezzar. Two major empires obliterated. Uh, Assyria will never return to the height of its power. Egypt will never return to the height of its power, all under Nebuchadnezzar's rule. And so uh, some might say, as you're now surmising, man, I bet Nebuchadnezzar had, had quite a bit of power. Oh, he certainly did. And with that power, he then seized to the south, Jerusalem. And so he, he besieged it. And under his power is this, the Babylonian Empire. In fact, it even expands a bit more than uh, this salmon-colored region. Uh, he is, for all intents and purposes, the leader of the known world. And all that said, we see now the height of the drama in verse 2. And the, the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. This makes no sense. Why would, why would God give this nation of his, this people of his, into a, a, the hands, of the, the clench of a Babylonian empire? Why would he do that? Well, uh, one thing I've learned about God is he always is true to his word. Uh, he told his people, listen, if you continue to rebel against me, if you continue to go against me, I will, he says, does God hand you into the hands of your enemies? And so in this case, that's exactly what he does. Not only that, but he then does Nebuchadnezzar, he takes some of the vessels of the house of God. Now this is incredibly blasphemous. So he besieges Jerusalem. He's going to take some of uh, the folks out of Jerusalem with him and and he also grabs, uh, in a blasphemous way, some of the vessels of the temple, some of the things that were the cherished possessions of the Jews. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, which is just another way of saying Babylon, to the house of his, notice the lowercase, God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his lowercase God. Well, who is the Babylonian God? I'm so thankful you asked. Uh, this is a picture that I would imagine is going to cause some nightmares for, for some of you. Uh, this is in uh, Babylonian mythology, the uh, great battle between Tiamat, uh, the queen of the sea, the dragon queen of the sea on the left, and she certainly is a dragon queen, okay? And then on the right, we have Marduk. Now what happens in the competing nature of these two is a Marduk begins to rise up against Tiamat. And because she is a sea dragon, uh, somehow like a fish, uh, Marduk is able to blow wind into her, okay? 
And as he blows wind into her, she begins to puff up like a balloon. This is true. You can look it up. True in the, in the mythology standpoint, okay? She, <laughs> she, begins to blow, she begins to blow up like a balloon. Marduk then takes an arrow, okay? And he slings it at Tiamat, uh, sending Tiamat into two pieces. And so what Marduk does is he takes her top half and he makes the heavens and he takes her lower half and makes the earth. And herein lies the Babylonian creation story. I'm so glad we have Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Anybody else? You know what I'm saying? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Thank you. I mean, who's hearing this saying? Oh, yeah, that's a great, yeah, that, that happened. The blow up like a fish. Come on now, right? But, but Marduk, Marduk is Nebuchadnezzar's God. Now, the the reality of Marduk continues even to infiltrate our culture here and now. Um, if, if you do a little bit of research on Marduk, soon you're going to find uh, some demonic bands uh, called Marduk. And so his influence in evil uh, still is with us. And it's, it's with this understanding of Marduk and the creation story and the, the tension of Babylon that we see then the height of verse 3. Then the king commanded, does Nebuchadnezzar, Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of nobility, youths, that's just a kind of a fun word to say, let's try it together, youths, okay, youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace, and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them, does Nebuchadnezzar, a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. This is quintessential to our understanding. So these uh, young people, uh, by age of 14 at its youngest, or 17 at their oldest, 14 to 17 is the range of these deported. Uh, they are going to get not pork steaks from the king's table. Nothing against pork steaks, okay? Some of you on a steady diet of pork steaks, that's fine. It just, generally speaking, a filet is a little better. Can we just agree? A little better quality, a little more lean. They're, they're going to get the best of the best. They were to be educated uh, for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. That's Nebuchadnezzar's plan of brainwashing. He takes a different approach than he did with Assyria. Assyria, he just wiped them out. He takes a very different approach than he did with Egypt. Egypt, he just obliterates them. Jerusalem, he decides to take 50 to 75 youths, and he begins to brainwash them. I just want to point out from the text we just saw the three pieces of brainwashing. The first is separation. Now, I grew up learning about Daniel from a felt board. Uh, some of you don't know what that is, and I'm going to explain it to you. Uh, I grew up going to something that was called Sunday school, and so, so we have uh, a lot of families. Well, right before our, our worship gatherings growing up, we would have a class time called Sunday school, okay? It was on Sunday, and it was school, okay? You can put those two together. And what the Sunday school teacher would use is a felt board. It's, it's like old school Velcro. And on this old school Velcro, there would be all of these characters and Noah's Ark and all these, you know, famous moments in the scripture. Well, well I, I never saw on the felt board the reality of separation. In, a, in other words, I always picture Daniel like, all right, let's go, to, let's go to Babylon. Things will be great. This is a kidnapping. These are real kids, real young people, 14 to 17 being pulled from their home, like some your age, pulled from their home, taken against their will. I mean, you can hear now, that, again, this wasn't pictured on the felt board, right? Like moms grabbing, their, trying to hold on to their kids. This is the reality. Now, these young people are dragged from their homes, separated, so much so that Nebuchadnezzar, through various means, could begin to brainwash them. It's Second mode of operation was to re-educate. We saw that, that, that they would grow in the wisdom of the Chaldeans. Now, the, the Chaldeans, uh, their wisdom 
was uh, synonymous with magic, sorcery, and somehow glass making, okay? Th th those, are th those are the three main issues of wisdom and knowledge for the Chaldeans, uh, magic, sorcery, and glass making. So, so these 50 to 75 are going to be exposed to a tremendously demonic things, things that were dominating the Babylonian empire. They were gonna be re-educated, and not just that, but they were gonna grow in obligation to Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, how was he gonna do this? He was gonna feed them. Why? why? Why feed them? Why give them the best of the best? Why give them the fillets? Uh, why not settle for the, the fatty hamburgers? It, it's because this deportation is gonna go in three phases. The first is gonna be the 50 or the 75 that we're seeing here. The second, he's gonna grab 10,000 Jews and the final in 586 BC, he's gonna obliterate the temple and then he's going to begin to massively deport the Jews. He wants these 50 to 75 beautiful, knowledgeable, strong young people to say, yeah, actually, this, this Babylon, it's not, it's, not, it's not too bad. Not too bad. Like the king, he feeds us well. The weather's, uh, it's, it's warm, okay? It's, it leans deserty, but you know what? It's like, this is, this is a good place to be. He, he's wanting to obligate them to himself. Uh, so much so that we see a massive shift happen next. Now, among these, here's our four characters that we're gonna be watching for several weeks to come. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. I told you previously, there are 12 tribes in Israel. 10 of the tribes reside in the northern kingdom primarily. Only two reside in the southern, Benjamin and Judah. And so these four, we're not a familiar, at least at this point, of their relationship to each other, but they're from the tribe of Judah. Now, what happens in these names is the chief of the eunuchs gave them uh, these names. Daniel, he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah, he called Shadrach. Mishael, he called Meshach. And Azariah, he called Abednego, or as VeggieTales calls them, Rakshak and Benny, okay? Again, ruined us. Now, we, we, we name people very different than ancient Mesopotamian times. When we were having our, our final child, and Heidi and I were talking, discerning through, all right, well, like, what are we gonna, what are we gonna name this you know, this child of ours, I had one stipulation. I was like, all I want is there has to be an X in it. Like, there just has to be an X. And, and so, you know, Avery, beautiful name, Dawson, strong name. This last one, I just want an X in it. Ergo Maddox, okay? There was no, there was no like arithmetic to it, just in case you're wondering. Maddox is not biblical, okay? In fact, he happens to be a picture of the Chicago Cubs, okay? Anyway, like, there's not, not some inspiring story. We, we choose names differently. Uh, some of you, you know, when, when you're choosing the names of your child or your name, you know, your parents are just flipping through the, oh man, that, that one, right? Yeah, that's, that's good. Or some celebrity kid's name, right? We choose names very differently. But in ancient Mesopotamian times, names have a ton of meaning. First, on the left side, I want you to notice the end, the suffix of each of their original Hebrew names, El and Aya. Uh, El is um, the piece of the name of God, Elohim. And so each of uh, Daniel and Mishael, they're, they're named after or in part of Elohim, the Hebrew God. Uh, the ayah uh, goes with the, the Hebrew understanding of Yah or Yahweh or God. And so every name in Hebrew in this case is very, very adjoined to the Hebrew God. On the other side, though, we have quite a bit of change. Uh, you're not gonna have time to write all these things down. Let's just go through them. So first, Daniel's name means God is my judge. Elohim is my judge. His name, and he kind of gets the short end here. I mean, Belteshazzar, I mean, that's just gonna be forever hard to say. Uh, Bel is the name for Marduk. And so Marduk protect the king. That's what his name means. It's changed to. Uh, Hananiah, Yahweh is gracious. Uh, Shadrach now, the, the command of Aku. Uh, Aku is the, the moon god in Babylon. Quite, quite a downgrade, okay, for Shadrach. 
A Mishael who is like the Lord, a similar Meshach who is like the Aku, again, who's like the moon god. And finally, in this pagan thought, Azariah, Yahweh is a helper to the servant of Nego. Nego was the god of vegetation in Babylon. So the whole desire of Nebuchadnezzar, of Ashpenaz, is to confuse. If we change some names, if we obligate them differently, re-educate them, if we separate them from where they're from, they will get confused on who they are. Now, the problem in lies for Nebuchadnezzar is there are some, including in this room, who know precisely who they are. And that's certainly the case for Daniel, verse eight. But Daniel resolved, I love the word. He doesn't flip a coin. He's not given an option and he goes away and prays about it for three weeks. He resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, politely it seems, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. Now, why would the king's food defile him first? Okay, the king is going to be providing a lot of food that is not, in a Jewish context, kosher. It's going to be unclean. So that's the first way. The second way the food would be a defilable or an ab abomination, Daniel would even uh, perceive, is because this food had been offered to pagan idols. And so on both accounts, uh, Daniel looks, a 14 to 17 year old young man, looks in the face of the ruler of the known world and says, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, go, ahead and, I'm gonna go ahead and pass on eating from your table. And I love verse nine, it escalates a piece of our God. God gave Daniel, God gave it. Not Daniel's obedience, God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. Let me celebrate something with you, friends. God blesses obedience. He blesses it. Worst case, worst case, our joy in Christ. I mean, he gives us and provides through the Holy Spirit joy. As so many of us, when we have seasons, we would say, of rebellion against God, We'll say things like, man, I just feel so shameful. I just feel so guilty. We use terms that the gospel isn't using about us because we're being shrouded with the lack of joy because of our disobedience. When we walk in obedience based on the Holy Spirit, empowered by God himself, it's amazing the joy that comes. I'm not saying that we're going to all the time get favor from the nation. Or that God's going to all of a sudden lay this kingdom down before us. That's not what I'm saying. It's just that when we walk in the simple obedience of our God, oh, the bountiful gifts that come through, please hear me, submission. And that's what happens here. God gives him favor. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, Ashpenaz, I fear my Lord the king. Don't miss this. I fear my Lord the King who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you are in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the King. We have here the tale of two fears. We have Ashpenaz who fears Nebuchadnezzar. And we have a Daniel who fears uppercase God. It's the tale of two fears. L listen, um, my head is, this is not gonna go well with Nebuchadnezzar, but remember, God had given favor. So Daniel said to the steward, to the understudy of Ashpenaz, said to the steward, uh, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Don't you love that Daniel continues to use those names? Come on now. Test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink, two of my least favorite things, right? Right here, right now. Vegetables and water, okay? Water is growing on me mostly because it's in Diet Coke, but vegetables, but vegetables, man, I, 
And listen, kids, it, vegetables are important. I just, I struggle with them, okay? Actually, crazy bowls and wraps, I like those veggies. Come on now, I like those veggies, all right? But, but there's like, and, and pepperoni. Crazy bowls and wraps, vegetables, and pepperoni, I'm in. That's not a vegetable. Anyway, <laughs> he says, he, he puts out a plan. Test your servants. So, look at this, verse 13. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. We're gonna eat vegetables, we're gonna drink water, they're gonna eat the king's food, the filet, the mashed potatoes, all right? They're, they're gonna go hard, we're just eating veggies. And we see in verse 14, he listened to them and in this matter, he tested them for 10 days, surely. Ashpenaz is thinking in his mind, no possible way. These guys are gonna look like they've been fasting for 10 days. Their appearance is going to be weak and feeble, but at the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. Now, we need to address the Hebrew language here, fatter in the flesh. This isn't that they put on, okay, the freshman 15 here. This isn't that, okay? It's just that in the Hebrew language, they looked better. They looked healthy. So, so you've got the, the 50 and 75, all the folks over here, and then you've got these four. Their appearance, uh, their skin glowing, their health gleaming. And so, <laughs> imagine being all the rest. So the steward took away their food and the wine that they were to drink. Everybody else, we're on veggies and water. Here we go, right. Everybody's getting veg. Who would have thought this would have been the case? And as for these four youths, God again noticed the Lord. God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And specifically, Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams, which is going to come to play for the rest of our story. Now, at the end of the time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, three years, the chief of the eunuchs, Ashpenaz, brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Saddam Hussein, who some of you uh, are familiar with, when he was building his empire, his kingdom, on every brick of his palace, he engraved the name Nebuchadnezzar. Saddam Hussein thought that he was, in some words, the reincarnated Nebuchadnezzar. We see other dictators in our history using Nebuchadnezzar as an example. Uh, he's a, an evil man with pagan intentions. And now all of a sudden, you're gonna have teenagers standing before him. Uh, do you remember when Paul tells Timothy, his young disciple, do not let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and impurity. Understand this, my friends. Young people looking at the ruler of the known world eye to eye. And the king spoke with them. And among all of them was a none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king. Stood out, we could say, before the king. And in every matter of wisdom, every matter of understanding about which the king inquired of them, he begins to poke and prod, ask questions. He's putting them up against his magicians. He found them, come on, 10 times, 10 times better than all the magicians and the enchanters that were in all of his kingdom. Don't you love seeing moments where light far outweighs the darkness? I mean, not even close. You got all of this demonic pagan activity and here comes the four brothers of light, 10 times stronger. And the scripture notes at the end of chapter one that Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. Again, the felt board doesn't depict this. We often imagine Daniel in the lion's den as a, a 16 year old boy. Uh, the lion's den is towards the end of this story. And because we know he's there till the first year of King Cyrus, this is how long he's there. 14 to 17 when he arrives, old and seasoned when he leaves. When he gets dropped in the den, okay, potentially breaks a hip. I mean, this is an old, this is an old man, an old man. But as I look at chapter one, as I consider, again, my reality, I ask, 
Why do we compromise? There is a, a tension that's been created within me as I've read this story for the however many time. How does a teenager, young in his perspective, young in his learning, young in his wisdom, how does he take a stand in the face of one of the most powerful men in the world? And I make compromises. I sign treaties of peace with evil when there is far less at stake and not a world power in front of me. As I've worked through this, as scripture calls, there's been a godly grief that's overwhelmed me as I've considered my sin. I'm grieving my sin. I'm grieving over the moments where I've shaken hands with the enemy. When he's become my ally. Maybe for just a moment, but an ally nonetheless. His strategy, the enemy, Satan's. Oh friends, Nebuchadnezzar's strategy had to come from somewhere. Nebuchadnezzar didn't learn these things on his own. Uh, since the Garden of Eden, these strategies have been deployed by what Scripture calls the ruler of the power of the kingdom of the air. He has temporary, temporary power. Satan longs for us to be separated from truth. Please hear me. Satan longs for you to be separated from community, from loving rebuke. And most of all, he prays on our nearness to God. He hurls arrows, does Satan, at what the gospel has accomplished. Think about it. The gospel has accomplished restoration of relationship between us and God that was broken because of sin. And Satan, in our life as believers, is constantly attacking that intimacy. He wants separation. Let's get those believers as far away from the Lord as we can. The enemy is luring, tempting us with unending noise through culture, the barrage of social media, and even slyly through the legalism or loose liberty within the church. The enemy is seeking to devour truth with deadly education. Even within the body of Christ, legalism and loose liberty, both heresy, amen? And it so easily infiltrates its way into the body of Christ, calling us not to freedom in Jesus, but to do's and don'ts, or calling us to take advantage of grace. That is not truth. And yet the enemy tempts us with it, as he did to our King Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. A Satan with a hand out awaiting our embrace or with a pen hovering over a peace treaty. He invites us to bend the knee. If we would just bow down, he says, he will give us the world. He will give us all, all that we can ever want. And any of this compliance, please hear me, any of this compromise, it rattles our identity in Christ. Though positionally still a son or daughter of the Most High, our belief in its reality grows more and more faint in the darkness of our compromise, of our sin. So why do we compromise? A misplaced fear we fear man over a king. We fear losing an acquaintance over exalting the Lord. We fear a downgrade in comfort in the here and now over finding refuge in Christ. We fear missing out on the pleasures of indulgence over trusting God's character to provide all the satisfaction we need. 
But I see one reality in Daniel's life. He believes something at the core of him. He believes that his God has never bent the knee to anyone else. And therefore, his God is God. And for that reason, a young man looks in the face of Nebuchadnezzar and says, I'm going to go ahead and worship the one who's worthy, not you. We have a decision to make tonight, church. Let's stand together. Come on. I want to simplify all of this in one statement for us. What if tonight and in the hundreds of times tomorrow that you'll be tempted to compromise, when you're tempted to gossip, when you're tempted to judge, when you're tempted to sexually indulge, when you're tempted to ignore your parents, when you're tempted to, tempted to, to backbite those against you, what if in all of those moments you simply asked, who is my God? In the moment of gossip, who is my God? Do I fear pleasing this person or coddling my insecurities? Or do I believe he's holy? He's worthy. God, shower us in your holiness tonight. Give us a godly grief over the ways we've made treaties with the enemy. And because of you, your character, who you are, God. Help us tonight decide who we will bend the knee to, you and no one else. Cover us in your holiness, God.